We decide to display data so that we can convey characteristics of the data visually. One characteristic we might want to uh, convey to the reader would be the center, something you guys probably have heard of as the mean or the average. Something else we might want to uh, show would be the variation of the data. How spread out is it? What's the uh, distance from one number to the next, basically? Or we could look at the distribution of the data. What's the overall shape? Uh, is it bell-shaped? Is it a uniform distribution? Is it uh, uh, bimodal, or what some people call a dumbbell, if you can imagine what a dumbbell looks like, or you know, a two-humped two camel would be a bimodal. Are there outliers in our data? Are there values that are way far away from the majority of the other thing? Or what's happening to the characteristics of our data over time? So these are all things that we might want to display visually. And that's why we would choose to do so with graphs. So when working with data, large sets of data, it's often very helpful for the reader if we can summarize the data into a table or a graph. Uh, and one of the more frequently used, no pun intended, uh, tables is a frequency table or a frequency distribution. And because computer software and calculators and all sorts of things can do these relatively easy, it's become more and more popular, popular to use. So a frequency distribution or a frequency table is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a table that lists each possible data value or sometimes a group of data values and then how often they showed up in your data. So here's a typical example where they collected a bunch of IQ scores and then they put them in groups or what's called classes, 50 to 69, 70 to 89, etc., etc., and then the frequency. So there were two people in our group that had an IQ between 50 and 69 versus seven people who had one between 110 and 129. That's a frequency distribution table. The uh, lower limits, as we see, the lower class limit is just the numbers on the bottom of each class, and then the upper class limits are the numbers on the top of each class. Uh, now, you don't have to have classes. You could also do a frequency distribution for uh, a data that you, know, you listed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 type of thing. If you had a very simplistic set of data that had a very small number of possible values. Class boundaries are the numbers that we use to basically designate when a data value gets bumped up into the next class. So if you had a score, uh, an IQ score of 49 and a half, you would round up to 50 and put you in the 50 to 69 class. Versus if you had an IQ of 69.5, it would round up to 70 and put you in the 70 to 89 class. So those numbers in red end up becoming what are called the class boundaries, the number at which your data value gets bumped up into the next class. The class midpoints, just like what it sounds, it's the middle of each class. So if you take the upper class limit and uh, subtract the lower class limit from it and then divide by 2, you get the midpoint, the simple midpoint formula. The class width is just how wide each class is, right? So from 50 to 69, that's a distance of 20. Um, if you do the math, if you do 69 minus 50, you'll notice that you get 19, but that's because you're not actually counting the endpoints in that case. So if you wanted to do it numerically uh, to figure out what the class width is, it's always the top number minus the bottom number and then add one. If you think about it uh, very simply, if you had the numbers from 1 to 10, wouldn't that be a width of 10? But 10 minus 1 is 9, so you've got to add one more to get back to the actual width. Reasons why we'd want to construct these uh, frequency distributions? Well, if we have a large data set, it's a good way of summarizing the data. Um, by looking at the frequencies, we can kind of get an idea of the overall spread of the data, the overall uh, shape of the distribution. Right, we get this overall idea of what the data looks like. Constructing a frequency uh, distribution, it's uh, not too difficult. You um, determine how many classes you should have, and you should keep this pretty small. You don't want 500 classes because then you just, you know, you can't take in all that data at once. So you keep your classes between 5 and 20. So you figure out how the width of each class width. Um, and round up. And to figure out the class width, you're basically taking the maximum data value in your set of data, subtracting the minimum data value from your set of data, which gives you what? Anybody know what that is? Max minus min gives you? 
the range. So you take the range, um, divide it by the number of classes you've decided. Remember, you, you decide how many number of classes you have, so you divide by the number of classes you've chosen, and that gives you the class width. The rule of thumb is you try to come up with a, a, a kind of an obvious class width of 10, 20, 25, 50, 100. Kind of, you wouldn't want a class width of 17. It just wouldn't make sense to the reader. Then you choose your starting point, usually the minimum data value or some sort of convenient value below it. If your smallest data value was a 7, you might as well um, you know, start at 0 or 1 or something like that then uh, you build up from there using the first lower class limit and the class width you figure out the upper class limit for the first one and then the next class is just built on top of that etc 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 you always list your classes from smallest to uh, biggest you know or uh, you know the smallest value to the biggest value vertically in the first column and the frequencies in the second column um, again if you're doing this by hand you can use tick marks or what are called tally marks and then when you're done with that you can add those all up and figure out what the frequency is but luckily technology does this all for us <clears throat> A relative frequency distribution is just like a frequency distribution, but instead of just telling us specifically how many values are in each class, you tell us what percentage of the data is in each class. It's a little bit more enlightening. Instead of just telling me there are seven in this class, you can tell me that represents 25% of the data, and that means more. So here's uh, an example of both next to it. So you have the frequency and then the relative frequency. So you can see that 33 actually represents 42.3% of our data, and those seven people with an IQ in the 110 to 129%, that represents only 9% of our data. You can also have a cumulative frequency where you're just adding up so you can see the numbers in the far right hand column are just summing up as we go. So 35 is just 33 plus 2 and 70 is just 35 plus 33 plus 2, etc, etc, etc. Gaps. If we have gaps in our data, um, then it'll show up in these tables. So it's, it's, it's a good way of seeing if maybe there's something odd going on that everything is clumped together in two groups and there's a big gap in between them. An example would be a frequency distribution of randomly selected pennies and the weights of the pennies are in the table. You've got uh, pennies made before 1983 and pennies made after 1983 and you see from the distribution that there's a difference in the weight so we can see that one group of pennies is in the smaller weight class, the 18 and the 19, and another group of pennies is in the higher weight class, the 2, the 25, and the 8, and there's nothing in between. So it suggests that the group of pennies we have come from those two different sets. We must have some that are pre-19, what was it, 85, 83, and post-1983. A histogram is a very popular uh, visual representation of data, and it's used to show the overall uh, distribution spread of your data you make a bunch of bars the height of each bar represents how many things you have in each class and there's a, a slight difference between a histogram and a bar graph here's an example of a histogram you'll notice that all the bars are touching a bar graph looks just like a histogram but the bars don't touch a histogram is used for uh, continuous data and a bar graph is used for discrete data so that's the difference between the two Relative frequency histogram is the same darn thing, only we're doing it for relative frequencies instead of frequencies. Interpreting your histograms. So, you know, making these things is easy. Technology can do it for us, but what's more important is being able to interpret what we see from them. So what does the shape tell us? Do the frequencies start low and then increase to just one and then come back down? Um, is it symmetrical? Um, those types of things are what we're looking for if we're trying to determine if this has a bell shape, a bell shape or a normal distribution. Here are some examples of bell shapes, i.e. normal distributions. You'll notice all of them have relatively the same kind of shape. They taper off at the ends, they have one clump in the middle, and they're relatively symmetrical. Now obviously some are better than others. The dark blue one is, is pretty crappy, but that's because there's probably not a lot of data. But then you start gathering more data and you get the one to the right of it and that's looking pretty good. The ones down below also, you know, some are better than others. 
but they're they're still pretty normal and then you have the two examples on the bottom right in the light blue that are examples of non-normal distributions you can see that hopefully the difference between those and the others that they have these tails that are longer in one direction so the first example is skewed to the right because it has a longer tail to the right and then the last example is skewed to the left because it has a longer tail to the left so the long tail is the direction of the skewness for you to help help if you remember so this is just what we were discussing about skewness positively skewed just means skewed to the right and negatively skewed just means skewed to the left because that's the direction in which the tail is going right if the tail is to the right the tail is in the positive direction some other examples of distributions we've got the the first one in green is pretty much your normal bell curve the red one is what's considered a uniform distribution because you basically have the same amount for every number then the one on the bottom left that's skewed to the right very good and the other one is skewed to the left okay assessing normality with a normal quantile plot is extremely hard to do by hand so luckily we don't have to it's all done for us with technology okay um, so don't worry about how to make these just worry about how to interpret them if you see one what does it tell you so here's some examples you'll notice that the lower left hand one the numbers are all kind of clumped in a vertical line the other two the numbers seem to be closer to the green line the more normal your data is so the closer something is to that perfect bell curve the more tightly the dots will line up on the line so you can see the first one on the top is not so great the second one bottom left is horrible and then the third one is really good so we would we would say that third group comes from um, a, a population with a normal distribution other types of graphs will use select which ones you use based on the type of data you have and the types of things you're trying to describe so um, our objective is always to pick the right graph for the right type of data a scatter plot is something whenever we have paired data x's and y's in this case the circumference of somebody's uh, waist and the circumference of their arm a time series uh, graph is used when we're trying to show how data changes over time simple enough a dot plot not used a lot it's very similar to a uh, histogram you know instead of bars you're just uh, putting dots so that's why it's not used a lot the histogram looks nicer stem and leaf plot or sometimes just called a stem plot this one's used pretty frequently and and basically all you're doing is on the left hand side is what's called your stem on the right hand side those are your leaves and uh, you have one digit your leaves are always one digit so um, you can see in that second set these IQs are 111, 115, 115, and 118. So the stem is the, the 11, the 11, one, and then each leaf is the last digit, the 1, the 5, the 5, and the 8. So that's how stem and leaves. You just put one digit in the leaves, and then the stem is how many other digits you have. Bar graph, as we've already discussed, is just like a uh, histogram. The only difference is bar graphs have uh, gaps, and that's because you have um, discrete data versus uh, histograms are for continuous data. A Pareto chart looks an awful lot like a histogram, right? Um, it's basically just a bar graph for qualitative data. So instead of uh, numbers of things, right? See, so these heights are, are talking about income. This one. Um, you have groups that are um, percents of people that have uh, you know friends or leisure work and what contributes most to your happiness so you ask them a bunch of uh, qualitative questions and then the heights of each bar tell you how many people responded each way right whereas in this one um, the bars represent numbers 1950 1960 etc 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 so that's the difference between those two pie chart just another way of visualizing um, how many people are in each category so it's still categorical qualitative data um, these are used a lot but they're kind of uh, bad because can you really tell how much more music is than sports I mean you can tell that it's bigger but how much bigger is it twice as big is sports 10% and music is only 17 right they're really hard to uh, be accurate with when you just look at it with a naked eye frequency polygon is uh, basically you take your uh, frequency histogram you put a dot in the middle 
of the top of each bar and then connect those dots. So it's really the same thing, which is why it's not used that much. People would rather just do the histogram. <clears throat> a relative frequency polygon, same darn thing, only now we're doing it for relative frequencies. An ogive or ogive, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I think most people pronounce it ogive. It's um, a, 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 your a frequency polygon, but you're listing cumulative frequencies. So if you remember back when we did our um, cumulative frequency uh, table, the numbers just went up because you were adding each new class to the previous class. So these things always end up going all of the way up to whatever the maximum was. In this case, I guess it looks like there were about 80 people uh, in the study. Now, bad graphs. There are a lot of bad graphs out there, and there are a lot of ways to make a graph misleading. These are some of the leading culprits. Some graphs are bad because they're just um, made incorrectly, right? They have errors. And other graphs are bad because um, they're misleading. They weren't created wrong. They just look, they tell a different story than they should. For instance, these two graphs are the same thing. They're showing the same amount of data. But the graph on the left, you'll notice, doesn't start at 0. It starts at 30, whereas the graph on the right starts at 0. But the graph on the left makes it seem like the Honda Civic really outsold the other two. Or, sorry, in this case, has much better fuel economy. Um, but when you look at them, when you zoom out and actually start at 0, you can see that the difference differences really aren't that pronounced. See, most people would look at this and they wouldn't notice that the difference between the Toyota Camry and the Honda Civic is from 31 to 36. They would just see this huge bar graph and this small bar graph and think that there is an actual big difference when there isn't. Pictographs are, are basically um, showing bar graphs with pictures and they can be very misleading um, to the, the reader, so avoid it. Here's a typical pictograph. And it's just much harder to kind of see the scale properly. Three-dimensional graphs are horrible because they're inaccurate. Right? The last box, the box on the right, is supposed to represent 74,000, which, if you compare it to the first box, numerically, that's only about four times as large. But if we look at the geometry of it, the volume of it, it's actually 64 times as large. So the scale is off because of those three dimensions. So the best thing to do is um, to just keep it simple. Unencumbered, don't have a lot of distracting things. Just present the data and let the people come to their own conclusions. This are some important principles suggested by some guy a long time ago. Adhere to him, don't adhere to him. Basically the, the the rule of thumb is don't just start, don't make it overly fancy, keep it simple stupid.